All right guys, welcome back to the woods. Today is part two of our Indian pipe or ghost pipe. So we want to cover some more topics about it. And then we, from our previous video, our part one, it's been about five and a half weeks, almost six weeks. So today's the day to go ahead and filter it off and we'll actually have our completed tincture. So we're gonna take you through the steps of filtering it and we'll talk about making that tincture a little bit more. So one of the questions that people are curious about is where to find the Indian pipe and how to find it. So typically, if you go out looking for your Indian pipe, it's not like mullein where you're gonna find it in a disturbed soil kind of area or the edge of roads or the edge of maybe like a field in the, in the woods where they transition together. So your Indian pipe, you're really gonna to wanna to go out to large, old, thick, dense forests. So when you look up at the treetops or as you're walking through the woods, where the trees are intermingled and make that canopy, that kind of really makes the bottom of the forest floor real dark and dense looking. That's typically where you're gonna find your Indian pipe. Another thing that they like a real lot is when you look at your forest floor, you want a lot of dead limbs and trees down. You want a lot of foliage and dead leaves on the ground. So these plants, they don't create their own chlorophyll. So that's why they're that white ghost color. So really, they're, they're not gonna be looking for sunlight like a lot of plants will. They don't mind being in that dark, moist environment. But now they are a flowering plant, so they're not a fungus, they're not a mushroom, so they're gonna absorb their energy off that root system that's underneath of the ground there. So just remember, a shady area is kind of what you're looking for. So a lot of times when you're out looking for them, they're pretty easy to identify because of that ghost color so they're gonna be slightly transparent, sometimes pinky, white, opaque, or, or opal in color, but they could also have a little bit of purple, purple streaks to them or grayish black streaks to them. And the younger the plants are, the head or the bell of the flower will actually be curled down, and that's a younger plant when it's first starting to grow up. So as it gets bigger, the flower part of that head will get fertilized, and as it's fertilized, they'll actually stand up and as it matures, it'll stand up. So typically when you go to harvest these plants, anywhere from like three inches, all the way up to maybe eight inches at the most, but really anywhere in between there is gonna be just fine for harvesting them. So a lot of times when, you're, when you go out looking for them, you might find one or two of these stalks and then you don't see any more. Well, a lot of times the real little ones are actually underneath the canopy of the dead foliage or leaves on the ground and are just starting to push up through the leaves. So if you find one, if you gently uncover the leaves and stuff on the ground, a lot of times you can find some more that are very close by. Usually, they also grow, like you might have one here, and there'll be clusters of them in nearby areas. So a good time to find these plants is if you have a dry spell, you haven't had much rain, and then all of a sudden you get maybe that rain that comes in where you have rain for like one to three days. It's kind of like with mushrooms. After you go in the forest after a rain, all of a sudden all these mushrooms have popped up off the ground. It's kind of the similar, similar to that. They like that moist, wet climate and that ground that's nice and wet. But if you have that dry spell, it's going to be hard to find them. Also, when you go out looking for them, it's not like a morel mushroom where you're trying to go out maybe mid end April to find those morels. This is going to be the very beginning of summer, all the way up to like early fall or the end of summer is when you're gonna go out and try to find these Indian pipes. So we'll also include a map that we found, and that map kind of shows you all across the United States and where you could find these Indian pipes. But now, you can find Indian pipe all across the entire world, but they are gonna be more concentrated in certain areas. So if you live in a desert climate that's super dry, super sandy, you're gonna have a hard time, or maybe not at all, be able to find them. You really gotta find that, that soil that's enriched with that dead plant material. So an older technique when people would actually go out to try to harvest these Indian pipes is they would either take the whole plant with the root ball and system, the whole thing. But nowadays we kind of look at it a little differently. So the, the flowering part of the plant is really the most potent. But a lot of people when they pick them, they use the stem and the flower. But if you've got a cluster of a half a dozen of them that's growing up, you really don't want to just grab it and whack it all off and take the whole thing. So it is a perennial, so it's gonna to try to come back every year. So if we can, we wanna come in there and only take a portion of that and really treat it like a renewable resource. 
So if you damage that root system, you're not going to be able to go back and find it. So I kind of was thinking about like morel mushrooms and thought it was a good comparison, not in the fact that it's a mushroom, but just in how to go approaching the finding and hunting of the Indian pipe or morels. So really, if you have a ledger, kind of keep a map system together, mark down where you find it, when you find it, maybe the weather and other trees or plants that you find around it, it's gonna help you in the future as far as locating these again. But let's say this year you go out and you found some, go ahead and harvest a little bit of it and mark it down in your ledger and then use that as a future reference. So over some time of a couple of years, maybe you got a half a dozen different spots now that you know that have this Indian pipe. So when you want to go find it, you can go back to these half a dozen spots and you got a way higher success rate of being able to find these more continuously. Also, like with the morale mushrooms, a lot of times people will pick those, then they'll bring in the spores to a different location and shake the spores out. The Indian pipe is kind of the same thing. If you have that Indian pipe that's completely standing straight up, that means the seeds inside that flower has been fertilized. So if you wait a little bit till those seeds are starting to come through, you might be able to transplant those seeds that are already fertile in a new area that you could try coming back to the following year. So I brought my backpack here, but inside of that I have my tincture that we've already started. So we're gonna take some of these things out and kind of get ready to take a look at them. So this is our tincture that we started previously. So we're gonna talk about this a little bit. So when you pick your Indian pipe, some people were kind of curious about, is it already dried out? It sounds kind of crunchy. You know, how, how wet or moist is it maybe? So when you first pick it, you want to pick it in, in its live, vibrant kind of state. So it has a little bit of crunch to it when you touch the plant or cut into it, kind of like an apple. Like an apple could be real moist and juicy or, or a potato, but when you start cutting into it, you could see the juice coming out of it. But it has that, not that it's fibrous, but it has that crunch to it a little bit. But now the flower head itself, after it's been fertilized, can actually get kind of hard, almost like an acorn would. But now when you put this into your alcohol, so we used vodka at an 80 proof, I believe it was. As far as your ratio goes, some people say you could use a 50-50. What we normally do is, once you put your Indian pipe in there, you want to pour enough vodka in there to raise it off the bottom a little bit and make sure that the entire top of the plant material is completely covered. So as it sits there, it almost looks more like a grayish black color right now, but within a day or maybe two days, it's going to change color drastically. So it's going to have a purple, bluish kind of hue to it, or maybe even a grayish black color to it. But as it sits there and you're letting it kind of marinate, come in there and stir it a little bit every once in a while and make sure you release any air bubbles that are down there. If air gets trapped underneath of whatever vegetation you have in here, you have a possibility of it getting uh, like turning moldy or that plant material going bad. So you want to shake it every couple days, turn it a little bit, make sure all those air bubbles get out. Don't turn it so violently, if you want to say, that you're forcing air back underneath of it though. Just stir it a little bit and push the air back up. So with this, you could also use other choices of alcohol that are about that 80 percent proof another one i seen people doing was rum but we always use the vodka though but after a few days it's going to turn into this dark color and what, it, what it's doing is, is it's extracting all that good stuff that we're trying to pull out of the plant and you're going to want to wait about five to six weeks for this process to be done so as far as the location on storing this when you're trying to make your tincture you want to kind of keep it in a cool dark spot so maybe if you have like a root cellar or maybe a pantry where direct sun's not going to hit it, that's going to really damage it. But we're going to go ahead and start filtering this now. So you could use any kind of container you have. Mason jars are awesome. But this is some potato cloth and that's what we're going to use to filter it. But you could use anything you have. Cotton t-shirt, bandana, cheesecloth. You have to layer it several times. But we're going to use this potato sack here. We're just going to use this funnel to try to help make sure we don't lose too much of it. And as far as storing it, another option is we have this little vial here. It has a little dropper. That's a good way to measure your tinctures out. And this amber colored glass is going to help protect it from any 
UV rays or anything that we're going to get inside of it. So that's going to prolong the life of this. So this is really simple, real easy. I'm actually going to use one layer, I think. But all we're going to do is just pour it in there. And we don't want to force it through it. Just let gravity, let it soak through the cloth and then drip through. As far as like the smell of this stuff, it's pretty pleasant. It doesn't, it does have a little bit of like the alcohol vodka smell to it, but at the same time it has kind of a, a flowery kind of smell to it, kind of like a sweet flower smell, but also has like an earth undertone to it. It smells pretty nice. It does have the alcohol va vapors coming off of it. So as far as making your tinctures, when you're making it and when you put it into your storage container, you want to try to have small bottles to limit the amount of airspace or oxygen that's going to get to the top of your tincture. The more airtight you can make your containers, the more that your tinctures are going to last longer and be more effective. So we could shake this a little bit, but what we really don't want to do is we don't want to squeeze it really, because if you squeeze it, you're going to push a lot of sediment back into that liquid. So we got our tincture transferred into our jar here. So now we're going to go ahead and pour it into our dropper vial. So we actually got a full vial here. So we'll have to grab another one to finish storing that. Actually, I overfilled it just a hair. But again, with these storage containers, try to use smaller ones and don't leave a lot of airspace above it. That airspace is actually going to damage it. So as far as how much should you start taking, you really kind of need to go slow with this if you've never been introduced to it before. So typically one to three drops is kind of your recommended dosage. And you could do that twice a day. So I would start off with one drop, see how your body reacts to it, see how you feel with it. Wait four, six, eight hours before you try it again, and then just kind of slowly increase as you get more used to it and see how your body feels and, and reacts to it. As far as what to use this for, so people use it for all kinds of different aches and pains, whether it's your headache, a sore throat, back pain. They're really looking at this as a alternative to like a heavier narcotic. So a lot of people are saying that this is actually non-addictive where some of those heavier narcotics, you're gonna to have to worry about being that addictive uh, traits to go along with it. But now, I don't really use it for pain as much as I would use it for if you're a person that has anxiety. So maybe if you're have, trying to go to sleep at night and you have racing thoughts, or if you have a lot of built up energy when you're trying to go to bed, if you take a, a dose of this stuff, it's actually gonna help you sleep and just calm your nerves a little bit. So this does react with your nervous system, and so it's going to deaden those nerves. But a lot of people, they say they, they still feel the pain, but it helps the mind separate from the pain. So if it calms your nerves and makes you a little bit more relaxed, it's going to help you not focus on that pain as much. So like with anything, guys, you need to make sure that you're doing your own research. Talk to people in your local area that you know that have used it or that can help you identify it and just make sure you use good judgment. So another thought that I had that I thought might be really helpful for a lot of people, but if you can maybe use some Google a little bit and research if you could find a local herbalist or maybe a survival expert. A lot of times a survival expert that's in your area, they'll have a medicinal section with part of their training program. And so they'll actually have a lot of these plants already marked out in the woods. So when you sign up for those classes, you can go on a hiking trip and they're gonna show you like, well, hey, here's some Indian pipe that we have, if it's the right season. But then that way you can get on your hands and your knees, climb right up to it and really get a, a good look at it and help you identify it. And also, if you find these people that are local, you might not have Indian pipe in your area, but they're gonna have that knowledge 
to be able to share with you maybe something that you could use as a alternative. But I'm gonna go ahead and we're gonna take some of this today. So with my eyedropper here, I kinda got an idea of how full I want it. And I'm gonna take about three or four drops of it. So it does have that vodka alcohol undertone to it, but at the same time, it has a very fragrant kind of flavor to it, almost like a, a mouthful of perfume, or like if you were to pick a flower and you ate that flower. It doesn't taste bad, but if you're a person that really doesn't like the flavor of vodka, maybe using that rum as an alternative might be an option for you. And also you could, if you really hate the flavor of it, you could always put it in like an orange juice or something like that and dilute it down a little bit as far as trying to mask that flavor. Another good option is maybe if you took this or mixed it with a spoonful of natural honey, that honey would go ahead and mask that flavor of, the, of that alcohol in there if you don't like it. As far as the medicinal purposes, it's going to take a few minutes before you really start feeling the effects of it. But I put it on the tip of my tongue and a little bit of underneath my tongue. But it has a little bit of a slight numbing effect to it. Some people say that it's kind of like when you get your laughing gas at like the dentist office. How you can still feel everything, yet it kind of puts you in a better place a little bit. And it kind of gives you that tingling sensation. So as far as the, the front of my mouth goes, it almost has a slight numbing effect, slightly tingly. Nothing that's overpowering or that's going to hit you like knock you off your feet just from a few drops of it. And I'd almost say that I do kind of have a, a slight euphoric kind of feel. A little bit of outside your mind a little bit as far as being relaxed. But I think this is a great alternative, a great option for people that maybe want to try something that's not just a chemical compound mixture that you buy from the pharmacy. But always use good judgment make your own choices. We appreciate you guys joining us on G2 Homesteading today. We'll catch you next time.